There's a word in Yiddish that I'm probably going to mispronounce. It's called flabungeon. It's when you go a ridiculously long way to get to some place when you could have just walked there. And in this case, I'm going to be flabungeon about, I'm going to tell you about the Ingersoll brothers, but I'm just using him as an excuse. What I really want to talk to you about is this guy, Tom Kassara. Here, let's start here. So the Ingersolls, uh, John and Fred, they ran huge, large-scale handbook operations in Cleveland, Ohio, and then later on in Miami. They moved to southern Florida, probably in or about 1945, 46, 47, that area. And they entered into a lot of legitimate and illegitimate businesses with the Fischetti brothers, uh, the guys who were supposed to have been handling Frank Sinatra for the Chicago mob. Um, the, but to be clear, the Angersalls answer to the Cleveland mob, to John Scalise out there. Uh, I think, I may, I was difficult to understand, but Fred Ingersoll may have been a member of the mafia. Um, it's it's it, Ingersola, by the way, so it's, it is Italian, apparently. Uh, they also were tight with uh, uh, Joe DiCarlo out of Youngstown. Mo Dalitz uh, and had them mix their funds with the brothers and the, there's some discussion it wasn't clear that the brothers through Dalitz had interest in Las Vegas it's possible because they were good at financing they were major financial backers for different operations throughout Florida John Angersola he had uh, arrest records in Columbus Detroit Cleveland Chicago Toledo they had everything from robbery, suspicious of murder, it's just incredible. But otherwise, they, they laid low. They laid low. And they, in their five decades in crime, they were only came out into the limelight twice. One was the Kefauver Committee. Kefauver wreaked havoc on those guys in Florida. Um, they were operating more or less out in the open. You know, they had bribes. Florida was a very different place by the way, in the late 20s, early 30s. It was virtually undeveloped. These guys, these Meyer Lansky, they went down there. They paid sheriffs and mayors and so forth. In fairness to these guys, they were gamblers. Today, you, I don't know if people would bat an eye. Uh, there weren't a lot of bad guy, bad guys down there, you know, murderers, that sort of thing. They were usually Jewish gangsters and they were usually uh, gamblers. So, in 1940, uh, the other problem they had, the brothers fell into, aside from Key Farfer, was the Woodford Hotel fiasco. In 1940, the Woodford, which was owned by the Woodford family, who were a prestigious family, um, they owned the hotel, and they leased it to two guys, Neil Young, and this Connect, who was an attorney, and this Connecticut-based lawyer, Thomas Cassara. Uh, he's from New London, which is, I'm from Connecticut. My father was stationed in New London during World War II. Uh, as a military policeman and he hated it and he used to take the train home and the policemen wore uh, cross pistols on their uniform uh, when they weren't on duty and he said he took them off he puts medical things on or something like that because being a military policeman on a train filled with troops was dangerous he hated it so much he took a job or asked for a job as uh, carrying the Browning automatic rifle through Europe Anyway, so the hotel is owned by the Woofords, and the police come to Mrs. Wolford and they say, look, you know, your hotel is a casino. There's some prostitution going on in there. What are you doing? She broke the lease. She said, I'm not going to put up with this, and uh, you didn't tell me it was a gambling operation. So this, she had to sue to reclaim it. Uh, she hired the, the mob, these gangsters hired their own lawyers to say, well, no, we've got a 10 year thing here. So we've got two more years to go. And also there was a clause in there that said, we have to be able to make you an offer to buy this place. So she cared about the community. She had other investments there and she fought them. She hired an army of private investigators. And what they found out is that the place was being run by this New York gambler, Frank Erickson, um, and Bert Briggs, who was Erickson's right-hand man, lived in the hotel and was operating everything for them. The other owners were Anthony Carafano, a.k.a. Little Augie, uh, New York thug, New York, New Jersey guy. Uh, he had a special interest to his father-in-law, Jimmy Kelly, who was like, uh, he had some title, vice president or something. 
the Ingersolls also owned a chunk of the casino through their nephews, Otto Lorenzger and John Carandonia. Uh, they were his, uh, they were their nephews and uh, attorneys. So Mrs. Wofford got the place back in 1950. Kassara got out of this somehow. He controlled the lease for one year and then he flipped it over to Frank Erickson, well, Frank Erickson's front men. And at the end of 1941, he left, he went to Chicago. Let me start at the beginning. In September of 1933, Joe Kennedy, Joseph P. Kennedy, John Kennedy's father, secures representation for Gordon's Dry Gin, Hague and Hague, Dewar's, and he sets up distributions to his company, Somerset, Somerset Importers, with a relatively small investment of $100,000, $100,000 in 1933, but still. So a short time later, this thing is bringing in $25,000 a year, $250,000 a year, uh, just an enormous amount of money. He was in the right place at the right time. Uh, prohibition was over. People were willing to pay for good booze, and he had it. His Southern rep was a guy named Charlie Block, who had a separate partnership with this Miami gambler, Bert Wingy Gruber. That was because he's a gangster. Uh, but Gruber knew Joe Kennedy. The connection came in helpful in 1944. Kennedy was having a problem breaking Hague and Hague into the Chicago market. So he called Block and he said, can you put me in touch with Gruber? Because uh, I need somebody, to, my man in Chicago, this attorney, Tom Cassara, needs help getting involved. One of, how this happened, who knows, one of Cassara's business partners in this importing company he set up, Raleigh Importing Distributors on Michigan Avenue, uh, they were Scotch whiskey handlers, was the notorious Rocco Di Stefano, who, aside from everything else, was also a dope dealer, but that's another story. So with Di Stefano's help, though, in this partnership, they are able to work a deal to get into Chicago through Chicago's liquor guy, Joe Fusco. It's about this time that Cassara moves there. He's in Chicago. He, he wants to stay and get this thing worked out. Fusco was an important guy. He had been one of Al Capone's most reliable bootleggers and operations managers. Um, he started out as right-hand man to Diamond Joe Esposito, uh, who was later killed by the, by the mob. Uh, he was the go-between, we're talking about Joe Fusco, between Esposito and the insane Jena brothers during the Prohibition. Uh, according to Esposito, I, I don't know about this, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway. Joe Kennedy um, came to Esposito because he, according to Esposito, Diamond Joe Esposito now, uh, he, he had screwed over the Purple Gang on some liquor deal or something like this, and they were going to kill him. And supposedly Kennedy went to Diamond Joe and said, can you help me work this out? And he did, and Esposito bragged all around the place that he's the one who brought Joe Kennedy into Chicago Mile. I, you know, that's a story I felt obligated to tell it to you. I don't know about that. Joe Kennedy was a powerful, powerful man um, in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, Diamond Joe Esposito didn't last that long. He was murdered early on. So that, that whole skit uh, a little sketchy, but anyway, now you know that story. So what happened was Fusco uh, traveled in the same company with big time mob, Chicago mob guys, Murray Humphreys, Paul Rica, Tony Arcota. Uh, and all three of them were partners with Fusco off the books in the Sands Casino in Vegas. Um, and so were, oh, Joe Kennedy's friends, Frank Sinatra and Jock, uh, Doc Starcher, who was later deported by Bobby Kennedy. Starcher claimed it was Joe Kennedy having revenge and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's more like fate, the Justice Department, um, and a snitch caught up with uh, Starcher and tossed him out of the country. That's probably more, I think, in fact, the deportation order was in place before Bobby Kennedy became Attorney General. Anyway, summer of 1946, Kassara thinks, I can just now I've got Joe Kennedy behind me. I've got all this money. I'll force Fusco out of the picture since he doesn't seem too bright. This guy didn't do his homework. And I'll, I'll make them distribute Kennedy's booze without a tribute to the mob, and I'll become a multimillionaire. Yeah, right. So one night, Kassara gets called to the Trade Winds Bar on Rush Street. 
The trade winds was notorious. It stayed open until the late 60s. It was owned by two 42 gang members, former 42, Marshall Caifano, who was essentially the killer on record for the Chicago mob, and Sam Tits Pataglia, as in, I'll punch your teeth out of your mouth. Kassara, uh, they called him to the bar. Kassara shows up with this beautiful woman. Uh, he's walking on the sidewalk. Somebody, he said he didn't know who, walked up and shot him in the mouth, knocked all his teeth out. Well, I, I, you know, it's probably Caifano. He was vicious. Um, he said he didn't know nothing about nothing, and he moved to Las Vegas, Los Angeles, I'm sorry, later on, and he acted as a front man for the mobs out there buying real estate. Uh, earlier in the day, to put this in the right perspective, Cassara had paid off to Stefano 100000 in cash to leave the partnership they had. So what happened, I don't know. It could have been they, they found out he was trying to muscle out uh, Joe Fusco, and they thought, okay, fine. And they put a gun to his head and said, give me a hundred grand and to get out of town. They gave him a hundred grand. And then they called him to the bar and they shot him in the mouth just for, they I obviously meant to murder.